Hello and welcome. My name is Lauren Schuller. I'm one of the Education and Information Board members for Miles for Hips. I'm joined by Dr. Eric Smith, the Chief of Arthroplasty at the New England Baptist Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts, where he specializes in total hip and total knee replacement. Dr. Smith, thank you for taking the time to talk with us. Lauren, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I apologize to everyone on the call. There's a little bit of background distraction noise and Apologies for that, um, but again, thank you for your time. Yeah, not a problem at all. To start, I'd love to hear about your path into medicine and what drew you to the field of orthopedics and particularly total joint replacement. Yeah, um, everyone's journey is a little bit different, but um, I always felt a need and a calling for medicine. And um, I went to college at a place called University of California, Davis, and uh, from there, I was able to um, get a spot at Tulane University School of Medicine in New Orleans, where I completed my residency. Um, after I finished my residency, I went into the United States Army for approximately the next 10 years. And I did my training in orthopedics there. I was always drawn to orthopedics just because of the, you know, um, uh, the background of the, you know, musculoskeletal care, like an athlete, if you will, that's kind of a standard thing. But what I really enjoy about it is the surgery itself. I, I, I have a background with um, um, sort of open procedures, and I always enjoyed that part of orthopedics. Great. And to expand on that a little bit, um, can you explain what a total hip arthroplasty or total hip replacement is? Yeah. So, yeah, to step back one second. So orthopedic surgeons can specialize in seven different disciplines such as sports medicine or spine or pediatrics, or in my case, hip and knee replacement, which is also described as adult reconstruction. And so a total hip replacement, for instance, would be an operation in which the hip is basically a ball in a socket. And the operation entails removing the ball by taking a saw and sawing it off um, because it's it has... Uh, damage to the cartilage and then likewise in the socket area basically taking like a cheese grater if you will and the cheese grater is rounded and it then cleans out sort of the damaged cartilage of the socket and then in that area a titanium shell is then um, inserted into that socket and likewise generally a ceramic ball is then placed to replace the one that was taken off of the femur. Great, thank you for explaining that. Um, what patients are typically good candidates for a total hip replacement? Yep, total hip replacement patients are those patients that um, suffer from pain that affects their quality of life and their daily activities, but the pain is, uh, the source of that pain is from the hip itself. Now, this can be very tricky, and this is where the art of medicine comes in, is that oftentimes there's more than one place in the body that's generating the pain. So, for instance, like the spine, a uh, pinched nerve or arthritis of the spine could also mimic a problem in the hip area. So it is sometimes complex, but generally it's those patients that are having pain from a worn out or degenerative hip joint. And since you see patients along the whole spectrum of care from initial diagnosis to first discussions about surgery and all the way through recovery, how can, patient, how can patients best prepare for a hip replacement when they're first presented with that as an option? Yeah, so the vast majority of patients with hip arthritis are treated by their either primary care physician or not an orthopedic surgeon. Obviously, surgery is the last um episode in that, you know, in that care. So generally patients who have some arthritis of their hip will, will tend to use things like non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like Advil, Aleve, or even Tylenol to try to reduce the inflammation and reduce the pain. Oftentimes they can change some of the ways that they exercise or they walk uh, to help relieve some of the pressure on the hip, such as the use of a cane. However, um, and then furthermore, there can be situations where patients would benefit from an injection of cortisone or corticosteroid into the hip 
in an effort to reduce the local inflammation when there's inflammation from the degeneration. Once these efforts fail, then typically patients are um, often candidates for hip replacement. In general, though, patients should maintain an active lifestyle as much as they can, maintain an ideal body weight, and if they have a certain medical conditions, to try to optimize those medical conditions prior to the surgery. Absolutely. Great. Now, once a patient has made that decision to go through with a total hip replacement, what does their recovery typically look like and what outcomes can patients generally expect? Yeah. So first off, outcomes that patients can expect are typically an elimination of their pain that affected their quality of life and their daily activities. They would be able to get back to doing things that they really enjoy doing without pain, such as walking, uh, walking, hiking, bicycling, um, uh, riding a bike, even playing sports like tennis or, um, you know, a whole myriad of those things. Um, Total hip replacements patients are typically not able to get back to running or jogging on a routine basis. The recovery to achieve those kind of outcomes can, I would say, in general, takes three months, but oftentimes it's much, much faster than that. Okay, great. And here at Miles for Hips, we focus on providing resources and support to individuals with hip dysplasia. Um, from your perspective, are there different considerations for a patient undergoing a THA with hip dysplasia versus a patient without hip dysplasia? Yeah, it's a great question. So there are multiple etiologies or causes of the degeneration of a hip joint um, for, for which hip dysplasia is one of them. So for instance, there can be avascular necrosis, standard arthritis, hip impingement, inflammatory arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis or other types of arthritis such as that. Hip dysplasia is typically characterized by a very shallow socket and also in which the femoral head is riding up and maybe out from where it should normally be centered. So instead of it being a true ball and socket, the socket is more oval or elongated. The technical considerations for surgeons when they're performing hip replacement on patients with dysplasia, they're considerable. And there can often be um, challenges in the proper positioning and placement of the implants because of the change in the anatomy from the dysplastic hip. So it, it, some of it depends on the severity of the hip dysplasia. In general, there are about four different levels or categories of hip dysplasia from level one being effectively, you know, a normal hip to level four being a hip that's hard to recognize, you know, as being anything normal. And there are different techniques that are utilized depending on how, how far away from the normal the hip is or how far the femoral head has migrated. Okay. So it sounds like, in patients with hip dysplasia, there certainly are technical considerations when undergoing a total hip replacement. So when those patients are uh, looking for a surgical team to do their hip replacement, what are important factors that those patients should look for in a surgeon? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, certainly for those patients that have um, more um, involved hip dysplasia, in other words, their hip is more abnormal or 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 has moved from its normal anatomic position, it's important to engage a surgeon that has experience in this uh, condition in particular, because it's not an easy condition to treat. There are some potential negative effects of hip replacement for patients with dysplasia, such as nerve palsies. That's when the nerve effectively goes to sleep. It's at a higher rate for those patients with dysplasia. And therefore, um, the surgeon needs to be quite aware of how to, how to uh, avoid those types of things. Yeah, definitely. Those are all really important uh, to consider. So I have one last question, which is, where do you see the field of arthroplasty going in the future and what excites you about any advancements to look forward to? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, the field of arthroplasty is continuing to evolve um, in which we are continually fine-tuning the process for the patient. And, for, you know, to do that, we have 
technologies that help us to plan the surgery and to execute the surgery more reliably. This includes things like robotic assisted surgeries and three di three dimensionally printed and evaluated hips prior to even doing the surgery. We can do some of those technologies now, but they're they're evolving. What excites me really is, you know, one is continuing to care for patients who who have you know those kind of problems which I can solve. Like I, I find it to be a complete privilege to be able to treat patients. One. Number two is um, you know, the, the idea of prevention is always an exciting thing, right? Is there something that we can do to try to reduce the age in which patients have hip replacement or the number of hip replacements that they undergo? And I think most of the newer technologies are trying to do that, trying to find, you know, why does arthritis hurt? Why does the hip joint wear itself out? So if there are ways that we can slow that process or to reverse it from non-operative treatments, that would be ideal. Yeah, that is very exciting. I think not only from a provider standpoint, but also from a patient's perspective, thinking about how these advancements can improve patient outcomes and improve the experience of patients undergoing a hip replacement. Um, and of course, these advancements wouldn't be possible without individuals like yourself and your colleagues who are really dedicated to research and working towards the best outcomes for patients. So I think that's really great. Um, but this has been a really wonderful conversation, and I know that a lot of people are going to benefit from hearing your experience and your expertise related to total joint replacement. Uh, so we're really grateful that you took the time to share this information with us and to share your passion for orthopedics and your passion for supporting and treating patients um, from the time of diagnosis all the way through surgery. So um, thank you again for taking the time to do this, and it was really informative, and I'm looking forward to sharing this. Lauren, as always, thank you so much for inviting me first and then uh, giving me the opportunity to explain my thoughts about this really important condition. Of course. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.